Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, today, Paul and I are going to be talking about erasure codes and kind of give you some information on what we've done as far as testing on uh, erasure codes with uh, the work that's been going on over the last couple of years. So by way of introduction, my name is John Dickinson. Um, I, I am the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and I work at a company called SwiftStack. This thing on? Oh yeah, hey, rock and roll. <laughs> All right, I'm Paul Luce. I'm not the project technical lead. <laughs> I'm one of the one of the core developers in the Swift community, um, and I work at Intel. Yeah. So the first thing we want to talk about is great. We've got erasure codes. So what in the world does that mean? And what are these things? And how does that actually? What's different now? So let's talk a little bit about the differences between the two. So we, uh, historically, or when Swift was first written, it was uh, written to support durability by using triple replication, or replication, which simply means that you take one piece of data and then you store it multiple times uh, in the system. And the way Swift does that is really intelligently so that it's gonna store each of those individual copies on multiple uh, physical failure domains, whether that's isolated by a drive or a server or a rack or even a data center. And so you can have uh, data go down and you still have, or hardware go down and you still have availability of your data. And that's what you have to do. If you need to have durable data, you have to store your data more than one time. And replicas are a really good way to do that. They're really simple to do and they work for a lot of use cases. But the cost, of course, is that if you're storing one gigabyte in, that you've got to store three gigabytes inside of the cluster. And some people have always historically come up to me and said, well, how do we make that better? What can we do? And the, the answer is always like, well, how much is your data worth? Did you just really want to lose all your data? Then, If not, then you need to store it multiple times. Uh, but there, there could be a better way. There could be some other ways that you can still get high durability while storing less data. And the way that's done is with something called erasure codes. Basically, erasure codes are a way that the data comes in and then it is, it's processed in such a way that it's broken up into different fragments that are each much, much smaller, so that the overall, um, the overall data that needs to be stored in order to rebuild or reconstruct the, the, the original data is uh, not much less than, say, the, the three times overhead you would have with erasure codes, uh, with replicas. So in this case, you have maybe a lot of fragments. You have uh, a much more than three. You may have uh, somewhere around 10. You may have more, you may have 20 or 30 uh, different individual pieces. And those individual pieces will then also be spread throughout the system such that they're on different individual failure domains. But the end result of this is that you get the same durability protection, but you pay much, much less in the um, overhead of storing the data. So you may only pay like 150% uh, cost for the, for the raw bytes instead of 300% with a triple replication. So what we have worked on in the last two years inside of the Swift community is the ability to support erasure codes. And the way we did that is we first implemented uh, something called storage policies, which allows you to take a set of data or a set of your hardware and isolate it and, and manage it a little bit differently than the rest of the cluster so that you can say that this kind of data is going to be stored one way and this kind of data is going to be stored another way. And once we had that functionality built in, then we implemented erasure codes as a storage policy for your cluster. So you can say that now I have a triple replicated set of data, and I also have an erasure coded set of data. And that can be on the same hardware, or it can be on different hardware. And what that gives deployers is a lot of flexibility in how they want to store their data, and it gives the end users the ability to kind of control what the actual cost they want to uh, pay for uh, storing their data. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, Intel and SwiftStack and uh, Paul and I and uh, various other people at our companies have been spending a lot of time saying that, great, now we've got erasure codes. So what does it look like and what kind of, how does it perform, how does it compare, and what, uh, what kind of recommendations could we give people who are interested in doing this? And I gotta say, it's really nice to work with Intel because they have lots of great hardware. <laughs> You know, I, sh I should add, um, I think it's clear by the title of the talk, we're talking about performance here. 
Um, if you're interested in exactly how erasure codes work, um, either how they were implemented or the, what the theory is behind it, um, there's lots of stuff available, including um, go to the, the Paris talks. Uh, Kevin Greening, who's one of the, the EC guys, uh, he and I did a talk talking only about the, exactly how erasure codes work, both theory and implementation. So we're sticking to performance here. Uh, and I want to throw one other disclaimer at it while I'm talking about performance. Um, this is performance as done by developers. <laughs> okay, so we're not performance guys. So if there's anybody out there that makes a living doing performance benchmarking analysis, um, you might be disappointed. We're not as systematic and detailed and thorough as, uh, uh, as, as some of you guys are because we're just poor developers. Um, but um, We've got a lot of good info. <laughs> yeah, that, that said, we really had three goals with our performance work. Um, number one, we, we really wanted to stress the system. Not caring so much whether we're optimizing every little knob and tweaking every little thing, trying to eke out every last operation per second, but we're really looking at integrity, data integrity and integrity of the system. And our first, uh, we've been doing this for months and months and months, and, and our first several runs on this hardware, um, we, yeah, we found lots of issues. So, so that was first and foremost. We wanted to stress it on, on a larger cluster than we typically test small features with. Um, number two, we wanted to understand the, the characteristics um, of how erasure code worked in the system under different loads, different workloads, different use cases, um, different uh, sizes of objects, and different, and, uh, different read-write patterns, put-get patterns. And number three, of course, we wanted to actually collect some real numbers um, and compare them against the same exact system running triple replication to give folks an idea and to give us an idea of, uh, like John said, how to make recommendations on when to use EC um, and what, if anything, should you be tuning for EC and what kind of you need to look out for. So that's kind of what, what was behind this. The, the picture here is of the, the main cluster that we used to do this. This was a 16-node cluster in um, Phoenix, Arizona, um, primarily E3 processors in the storage nodes, E5s in the dual proxies um, with a load balancer uh, sitting on top, four different Xeon machines for workload generators. Um, we used a combination of Cosbench and, and SSBench, so we used multiple tools because, again, this wasn't so much about um, trying to c come up with one systematic performance study as it was throw the kitchen sink at this thing and try to break it. Um, oh, and also let's see what performance looks like, right? So that was uh, kind of how that worked. Um, this is all 10 gig on the back end. Um, we had 20 gig uh, ingress from the load balancer, 10 gig on each proxy, and then 40 gig out to the cluster. Um, so um, you'll see most of our numbers, we didn't, we weren't um, network bottlenecked because um, we we're looking at other things, um, but we had plenty of overhead um, and we still have the cluster. We've also got some uh, yeah, equipment we at SwiftStack. So. We had a smaller cluster in our lab at SwiftStack, which is a little more network constrained. It merely had 10 gigabit networking. And uh, so you'll see some of the results of that. So. We wanted to cover two things. One is kind of like the holistic system performance differences, and, this, and the other one is like kind of the end-to-end -end sort of thing. Uh, what does it mean for Swift as seen by an end user? And then secondarily, we focused quite a bit on what is the actual hardware resource utilization, and what does that mean for CPU and memory and, and that sort of thing. So first off, the performance differences, and what does this look like? So uh, kind of that's the first thing that really people care about. I've got replicas. Should I go to erasure codes or not? So if you have, say, a uh, heavily loaded system, and you have a lot of traffic to the cluster at the same time, and you're comparing, OK, what kind of various erasure code policies am I using? How do they compare to one another? And how does that compare versus replicas? This is, uh, this is a picture of what that basically looks like for different object sizes for replicas versus erasure codes. And you can see there is an actual divergence here. So the two at the top are replicas. That's 2x replication and 3x replication. And the, um, the interesting thing here is you'll, you'll see that it, uh, it, it's probably very hard to read, but the, uh, the y-axis here is megabytes per second. So we're actually uh, ending up network bound on this. Uh, we're, we're saturating a 10 gig pipe really on both situations. Um, but really what I want to focus on is the trends. What do you see here? It's not so important what one particular data point is, but how does this perform over time and throughout the entire cluster? And so the important thing here is that you'll see that along the x-axis there, we're going from smaller object sizes to larger object sizes. And especially in the early stages there, when you've got the smaller object sizes, uh, which as we know, there's a lot of very small objects being stored in Swift clusters today. Um, Replicas far and away are much better at reads. So you're going to read your data, you're going to get better performance out of replicas. And that makes sense because 
the data is taken off of the drive. It's piped over the network to the proxy, piped to the network to the client, and that's it. It's just kind of a really straightforward data path there. And when you're doing the erasure codes, it's uh, pulling that from multiple servers, and then it has to recombine those with the erasure code library, and then it sends it out. So obviously, that extra overhead of reconstructing the erasure code frag fragment, uh, fragments into the original data will necessarily add some overhead. But the important point here is that we've got, we're, we, we're able to saturate, especially as we get to larger, uh, larger object sizes, we're able to saturate the network. So it's not actually, um, it, it's not slow, it's just when you get to larger object sizes, you're gonna probably be network bound just like you would be th with replicas. Now let's compare that to gits. I'm sorry, to puts. So if we have an active cluster and we're pushing data into the cluster. So think about this. If we've got replicas and we're storing, say, one gigabyte, and we push that into the cluster and you have triple replication, what happens is that when it gets to the cluster, as the client is streaming it to the cluster, the cluster is then streaming it out in triplicate, so three times, which means that your internal cluster network requirements are basically your replica factor more than the internal size. So if you're sending in one gigabit uh, per second, you need three gigabits out on the back end side. So what that means is if you have a 10 gigabit network, you're gonna saturate it at roughly 333 megabits per second because you have to send that out three times for triple replication. And that's exactly what you see here. The red line that uh, initially starts fast and then kind of plateaus there, plateaus right above 300. Big surprise. Now the green line that you see going up plateaus right around 500. That's a 2x replication, a kind of a reduced redundancy sort of uh, scheme. Now the erasure codes, when they come in, they're not actually sending out that much as much data as the replicas over the internal network. That's kind of one of the benefits you get with erasure codes. So that you can see that you're still able to get full network utilization, at least on this 10 gig network, and the various um, the various different erasure code uh, schemes that we were using, uh, we had lots of different uh, parity and data bits um, uh, tested here, kind of all follow the same trend, such that the larger objects show better improvement as far as what is the actual throughput we can achieve from a client perspective when we're doing erasure codes versus replicas. So this is actually exactly what you'd expect. And based on these tests and kind of what we're looking at, um, we think that the erasure codes are really going to start outperforming replicas when you're talking about writes in a busy cluster, probably when those writes are about eight megabytes a size. So there, there's a few different tests that you can see that it's, you know, some tests might show a little bit before that, some may show a little bit after that. Uh, Paul's tests in the larger cluster showed something that was a little bit uh, after that, but like I said, we were a little more network bound in this, in this smaller lab cluster. So uh, the point is, as you get larger, you're able to get better throughput with erasure codes, which is a really interesting point. So let's look at not the network throughput, but the actual number of operations per second. So we've got kind of a 50-50 read-write workload here and then just the read and just the write. The red bar is replication. If we've got 4K objects, use replicas, obviously. Especially this is, that's, uh, that, middle, why. That, that middle spec there is on, is on reads. And so you're, you're getting up to 10 or 12,000 uh, operations per second uh, pretty easily with the 4K, um, the 4K reads. And obviously that just radically dominates or, or just blows away the erasure code performance when you're dealing with those very, very small objects. Um, now, we know that quite a few Swift clusters are using 4K objects, 10K objects, 100K objects. And so when you're looking at if that's your workload, that's kind of something you need to take into mind and realize that, well, replicas actually work really, really well for this kind of content. Now, what happens if you take, instead of 4K, you did four megabytes? And in this case, it's interesting because they start getting a little bit closer. Replicas are still, still a little bit better, both on reads and writes, and when you have a combined workload. Um, so it is, uh, but, but you see a, a, a pattern starting to emerge here. And then when we get up to something that's uh, much larger, like a 64 megabyte file, well, guess what? They're basically going to be the same uh, performance based on our testing, is that uh, the reads and the writes 
uh, are, are roughly s the, the same. In this particular set of tests, you can see that the erasure codes were a little bit faster on the writes, but the reads were basically the same. Um, but then again, the replicas on a 50-50 workload were a little bit higher. Uh, the point is, though, uh, the trend. So we've got the, the small objects really good for replication. You've got the larger objects is a much better fit for erasure codes. Or erasure codes are much better fit for, um, for uh, those larger objects. So that being said, what's going on on the inside of the cluster? All right. uh, Two years for those three graphs. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the so the next set of slides is really focused more around um, internal, what's going on in the cluster. Um, and I'm going to flip to the first one. In fact, John, if you could steer yeah, these. Okay. I'm going to go over here and point because it's going to be too difficult to point from, from up there. Okay, so again, this was developers doing these tests, so I'm going to have to explain how these charts are to be read and interpreted. Um, and then, again, the disclaimer, we weren't going for make this run as fast as we can. I mean, obviously, that was a background goal. What we're trying to do with these charts is look for trends within EC and within replication and see if they match irrespective of each other. So, right, does EC perform in one particular case better than replication does in that same case, or do they ba basically both follow the same kind of trends? And from a developer's perspective, we're looking for anomalies that we didn't expect, right? So this wasn't as much around the performance numbers themselves as it was understanding and um, the code that we've written and how does it behave. So that said, um, this top chart here uh, represents uh, erasure code. And the way you read this thing is this is total cluster proxy throughput. Um, the blue is coming into the proxy, and the yellow is going out. And this is several tests in a row. So this is sequential in time. These numbers don't exactly line up, but the order is correct. So 1 megabyte, 4K, 4 meg, 32 meg, 64 meg, 5, 12K. You can see that roughly right here, this is the 1 megabyte test for replication. And you can see, um, you know, uh, close to four gigabytes per second out. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of puts going on there and some reads going on there. This was, this was the one megabyte test, and then there was some cleanup between the tests, and then the 4K test, and some cleanup, and the four meg test, so on and so forth. This was a separate, separate test, right, separate series in time, um, but they're just sort of laid out here so that they kind of sort of match up, and you can see where the peaks and the valleys are roughly the same. So not so much a comparison between this chart and this chart, like I was saying, but a comparison between what does this profile look like and what does this profile look like, and are they roughly the same? Um, and you know, we went through and, and looked through all this, all this stuff, and really the, the bottom line is in most cases they are pretty much the same, which is good. We didn't have anything. Well, we have one bizarre thing we have to go look at, but it's, <laughs> you don't see that on this slide. Um, what you can pick out on this side is uh, some things I've highlighted right here, smaller sizes, as John's um, outside of the cluster looking in showed. Um, EC is much weaker. Right, there's some gets at, uh, at one megabyte, and there's some gets at one megabyte in replication. Uh, obviously, a lot more throughput in the cluster with replication with it than with EC. Um, and then uh, on the larger object sizes, uh, you can see where EC peaks a little bit higher, uh, and that would have been the 64 meg right around in that area. And then we had a few little anomalies collecting the data, and one of the tests hung for a little while, so some weird stuff there. Uh, also, um, one thing we wanted to note, I mentioned we were trying to throw the kitchen sink at this thing. We did more than just vary object sizes um, and put get ratios. Um, we also varied the EC parameters, um, which includes the ratio that you use. Most of this is 1014. Um, SwiftStack did a bunch of tests with other ratios. We did some others as well. We didn't include it all in here because we'd be here for three hours just looking at graphs and everybody would fall asleep. As a way of uh, clarifying that, what that means is that uh, when, you, when you take the data and you're erasure coding a 1014 or uh, alternatively phrases like a 104, it means that you've got 10 data bits uh, and four parity bits, which would, you can see that if you've got four uh, extra bits there, that's going to be a 40% overhead. Um, so instead of like a 300% overhead, you've got 140% overhead for this particular durability scheme. And you can lose any four of these individual pieces, and you'll still be able to recover the data. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, John. So uh, another, another thing we varied was segment size, which, uh, again, you kind of got to go watch the EC talk to get a feel for what all these parameters are. Um, but that's something we messed with, looking to see if that had a significant impact. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't in general. I mean, it, it has a little bit of impact, but not huge. Um, and we also toyed around with uh, the various chunk sizes. Um, the non-EC-related parameters, right? The incoming network chunk size, the disk chunk size, both at the storage node and at the proxy, trying to figure out exactly how all this data flows. Um, and, you know, at a, at a high level in the EC world, uh, we're bringing in data and buffering up to a segment size in the proxy before we actually start pumping it out the back end. So we've kind of got, we've got to fill a buffer before we start putting it out there, and there's multiple buffers to deal with. So we toyed with those sizes a lot as well. 
Okay, next slide, John. Okay, so this, this talks about some of those EC variations. So this is actually five different tests. Um, these are all the same series of tests like, like we saw before. So starting with one meg and going to four meg and that, that sequence of tests. This first one um, shows EC with a 640K segment size and 64K chunk sizes across all of the network uh, and disk parameters that you can configure in Swift. Um, so it's basically all the defaults. This one is replication. Um, and then we have three different ones um, following up after, th after that showing um, variation of segment size uh, and disk chunk size and proxy chunk size. So you can see there, there are definitely some differences, um, but no gigantic, huge, oh my gosh, if you're going to use EC, the defaults for Swift don't work. We absolutely did not come up with any conclusions like that. All of the defaults that we have right now, you go to master and pull it, um, are um, pretty good. Okay, so let's look at uh, the, the number of requests. So this is really just an, another picture of the data that um, reflects what John showed, right? It, which makes sense, of course. Um, we're not going to see a different number of requests um, by status code internal versus what um, the, uh, the benchmarking code is seeing, um, you know, looking into the cluster. Um, so again, same, same series of sizes through here. This is actually should be maybe shifted over just a little bit. So this peak lines up with this peak and this one with this one. Um, but again, what we're really looking for is the trend going this way in EC where we see the highs is it basically the same as we see in, in replication. And the one standout here, um, which makes sense because John just explained it, was the small, um, small files. That's this gigantic peak that sort of blows the scale out of the water here. Um, on replication, if we didn't have this thing going up to over 10K requests per second, you would see the pattern of these peaks is basically the same as the pattern of the peaks in EC. So they trend the same. Um, when we beat on the cluster with different sizes. It's just the absolute values are different. So that's, uh, again, a really good warm and fuzzy for us on the development side. Okay, so now let's take a look at CPU utilization. So this was a big one that um, there was a lot of speculation on early on when we started the project. Um, you know, how much CPU are we going to be eating up um, doing erasure code? It's complex math. Um, there is no math in, in replication, so what's going to happen? Um, so here's the picture. Um, this is a, a slight different tool collecting this data. Um, so what we're seeing here is all of the EC runs in this piece of time, the same series of sizes, um, and then all the replication runs a couple hours later, and this is CPU utilization uh, at one of the proxies, and we looked at both, and they're basically both the same thing, so they were pretty evenly balanced. Um, you can see that uh, a, across the board, the average um, went up from about 10% to 16% utilization, so not significant, um, but worthy to note is that there are you know, quite a few more peaks uh, in the EC side than on the replication side. So much smoother CPU utilization um, in doing replications, um, you know, puts or gets versus uh, on the EC side. But overall, not, not a huge tax on the system. So more good news. Um, again, more, more good news because this was expected. Um, so we like things that come out the way we predict them. Um, this is our memory utilization at the proxy, at, at either proxy. Wow. That was weird. All right. Looking good. So what the graph is showing is, is free memory or available memory. And you can see before the EC runs start over here, we've got about, I don't know, 60 gigs worth of memory available at our proxy. So both our proxies have 64 gigs of memory in them. As the tests progress, we end up chewing up tons and tons of memory. We get to around the 64 megabyte section of the tests, and you can see we're eating up quite a bit of memory. Um, and when we finish the EC tests and we move on to the replication tests, um, all that memory is freed up. Right? So this is all going, as I mentioned earlier, this is all buffering segment size. Right? So if you're doing triple replication of a 64 megabyte object, the only thing you're buffering in proxy memory is the size of those, those chunk buffers I mentioned earlier. But in EC, we have to buffer an entire segment, which in our case is one megabyte. So for every object that's coming in, we're going to chew up a megabyte of memory while that object is in flight. So that's what this reflects. Right. And that's as compared to what the just the network chunk size, which is by default in Swift. 
um, a 64K. Yep. So the difference on uh, what is actually in RAM in the proxy server, and this is exactly what you see. So the replication run is only for each request uh, buffering 64K at a time, whereas the replication, I mean the erasure codes is buffering up to a megabyte at a time for every individual request, which perfectly explains exactly why you would see this sort of memory, increased memory utilization on erasure codes. Okay, next. And by the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions and we'll take them as we go or we can hit them at the end. Um, so now let's look at CP utilization down on the storage nodes. Now on the storage node, um, we did have a lot of changes in, the, in both the put and well, primarily in the put path um, that really don't have anything to do with EC. They just had to do with how the implementation came out and how we had to deal with getting the data down and making sure we've got all the integrity that uh, checks that we need in place. So there's a lot more stuff going on down there than, um, than there is in replication. However, in these tests, none of it is, is actual EC math. Okay, so all of the math is being done in the proxies. So that's the way our design is um, when you're doing ingest, right? We do the calculation of parity in the proxy um, and the storage nodes just accept blobs of stuff. And they don't know what it is. They just put it down, do what they're told. Um, and then on the get side, the storage nodes just spit back their blobs and the proxy is responsible for doing the math and reassembling the object. The only time the storage node gets involved in erasure code operations specifically is when it's reconstructing data. Right, because of a, a, a rebalance or a data loss or, or hard drive loss, whatever. Um, but that wasn't going on in this picture. So what you're seeing here is roughly equivalent CP utilization, um, a little bit choppier over here. Again, I, like I said, we, we did make some changes in how objects are stored, but it was more sort of housekeeping stuff because of how Swift works as opposed to erasure code specific. Um, and then um, triple replication over here. So nothing really significant there, which is good because we didn't expect there to be. Okay, this, is, this was a little unexpected, thus the word yikes. <laughs> um, you might think this is the, a picture of the proxy node based on what we just described, but it's not. This is a picture of a storage node, just one of the storage nodes. They all look like this, um, and what's happening here is during our EC runs, um, we're chewing up a, a pretty significant amount of memory. You can see, um, you know, like 20 gigs of memory. I think it's 19 gigs of memory um, that, that we're using throughout a variation of sizes and operations, whether they're puts, gets, or a mix of operations or, or not. Um, and then when we move into the, the replication runs, you can see a significant amount of that memory um, is available again. Um, we're still investigating this. We don't have, um, we've had some ideas, of course, because we wrote the code. Um, but um, there's, there's nothing that stands out. Oh yeah, we forgot to do blah. And that's why we're using up all this memory. So um, this is something that um, we will be uh, addressing soon, or at least understanding. Um, and documenting so that folks purchasing uh, equipment and deploying for EC know what they need, right? And we already know on the proxy you're going to need more memory. On the storage nodes, if you do it today, you need more memory. Maybe tomorrow you won't, but... So that bl brings us to... Okay, now what? So we kind of looked a little bit at the CPU utilization and the memory utilization on the proxy server and a particular storage nodes and kind of how is that characterized and what does that actually mean? You kind of understand a little bit about from the end user requests, what generally does that mean? And so we know that in general, erasure codes are going to be better for large objects and replicas are going to be better for small objects. And there's obviously tons of different knobs we can tune in there and there's things that you're going to have to uh, take advantage of there, but that's kind of a kind of high level thing. So what are some of those kind of use cases that we already know that people are interested in and in asking for erasure codes? like? Why do we actually make this and who are the people who are wanting this? So there's a few things that um, I would suggest that are really, really good use cases for uh, erasure codes. Um, backups, fantastic uh, use case. Video storage, because they've got these large data files. Um, and kind of the, I, I know some of the uh, biotech uh, industry is using Swift to store like lots of genomic data and things like that. But the, really the point is you've got these large data sets that's kind of this um, worm-like data. It's got the, the write once, but then you can read many times. Um, you don't really overwrite your data. You don't, um, uh, you don't go out and delete it. You're not uh, putting this massive amount of data in, but you've got a big data set that you may need to read, or it's in the case of backups, you hope you'll never have to read. And, uh, but there, there's this kind of large chunks of data. Um, these kind of things, really great for erasure codes. Um, if you've got something that you wanted to, uh, you wanted to store some backups, then being able to configure a storage policy uh, for erasure codes and then putting all of your backups into that uh, particular container that's cont uh, for that uh, storage policy, great idea. And, and you know, one other thing, and 
the, obviously the, the common denominator here is large objects, um, but that's, that's us making an assumption that it's a requirement that the performance be the same if you're switching from triple replication to EC. There is a price performance balance, right? So it's not the case that every usage model says, I have to meet the performance that Swift happens to hit with triple replication today. If you're willing to pay 20% performance to save 50% on CapEx and OpEx, then you might use EC for smaller. I'm not saying 4K like we saw, but um, but you know, I just don't make sure you don't walk away thinking EC is useless unless I've got 64 megabyte objects. Not the case. It depends on what you're willing to pay in that price performance balance. Yeah, it's a really good point. So that being said, then does that mean we should use everything and go for go for ratio codes all the time? If if it's going to save us some money, because you know hard drives are what's really dominating the cost of your cluster, uh, just use register codes all the time. And I would say no, don't do that. Swift is still really, really, really good at replication, and there's a ton of use cases that are there. This is not in any way a replacement of replicated storage inside of Swift. This gives people a new ability to do new things with Swift and to be more efficient at a few of the, the things that people have already been using Swift. So we know that Swift is used all over the world. We know that people are using it for the document management stuff, being uh, uh, all the online content, media storage, video streaming, games, CDN, data processing, mobile content, all of that kind of stuff. But one of the very, very important things is that you should absolutely keep erasure codes inside of a single geographic region. And replicas, if you've got multi-site requirements, which I know many Swift deployers do, you really want to use re replicas for that. And people will think about it, it's like, well, but what I really want is, uh, I, I want to really want this, the advantages of erasure codes, but I also want it to be distributed globally. And not yet. Don't, don't do that yet. <laughs> let's do one thing at a time. Let's, We're walking let's, before we run. Right. But we will get um, there. So those are things that obviously people are uh, asking about and very interested in. And so, again, it becomes that price performance balance. If you've got the requirements for particular uh, performance and you can pay a little bit more in the hard drives and or, or you have very small objects, I um, mean, you need to make sure that kind of things uh, work a little bit better so, uh, with that, then replicas are going to be really good. If you need to really save the money on the hard drives and you can pay a little bit more in the extra CPU and the extra memory requirements um, and you don't have uh, a lot of those really, really small objects, then EC is a, is a really good uh, consideration there. So that being said, um, where are we going from here? Uh, we're certainly not saying that uh, EC is done just in the same way we're not saying that Swift is done. We're continually working on it every day. And so we'll continue to improve it. So what are those kind of things going to be doing? The biggest thing that I think jumps out is the small file issue. And I know that there are people out there who say, I can't do erasure codes right now because I actually really can't control how my users are putting things into the cluster, especially at the public, uh, public service provider sort of model. You need to be able to, uh, if you're going to segment your data for large data goes to erasure codes, that's really great when you can actually control the applications that are sending the data into your uh, cluster. But what if you can't? Well, in that case, it's kind of hard to use erasure codes because you're going to configure it and, and add the extra capacity. You get the cost savings, and people are going to put in a billion one-byte objects. And you're going to think, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so in that sense, um, I think one of the biggest obvious things is to, inside of the erasure codes, offer a better, or inside of Swift in general, is offer a better automatic way to handle small files uh, so that when you put small files in, we're not trying to do erasure coding with one megabyte chunks when we have 4K. Yeah, the, the key there is automatic transparent, right? Right. Right. So there's a, the, we, we, it's not, we're not short on ideas. We've got lots of things that we could do, but, um, but the, the key goal there is the application shouldn't have to care. We want to give them better performance on small files, um, small objects through some mechanism behind the scenes. Yeah. Another thing that shows up, uh, is especially if you're looking at those memory graphs, is saying that, well, what's going on with those memories, uh, the, the, the memory usage? And, you know, we've got to figure out where exactly that uh, lines up, confirm that with other tests and other clusters with different configurations, and make sure that that's something we find the root cause on and we make sure it doesn't go away. But in general, that's no different than we're doing for anything, including all of the replicated storage today as well. The point is now, we, as we go forward, the future work is as we find bugs, we fix them. And we have some ideas on how to make some things uh, better and how to improve those sort of things, but that's not at all exclusive to erasure codes. And so um, overall, um, 
we've got to continue to make Swift better. What's really great about that, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. I think the last, the last part uh, to talk about as uh, kind of future work is there's been obviously a lot of conversations in the, in the community as well about now I've got erasure codes, now I've got replicas, how can I automatically move from one to the other based on uh, when's going, uh, some policy as far as how hot the data is or, or how old the data is or something like that. And yes, we hear you. There's, there's huge amounts of uh, uh, people talking about we need this data tiering, we need to figure, solve how to do policy migrations and, and management. Uh, and so that's things that people are working on, and I think that you will see that inside of Swift over the next, uh, work on that over the next years to come. So uh, definitely, uh, that's where we are. But to back up just a little bit, I think the, the way I characterize that, saying that we're going to keep working on erasure codes, we're going to keep working on, our, on replicas, we're going to keep working on adding features that are supported by both, um, and as we find bugs, we're going to fix them. So that leads to the question of, should you use erasure codes? Should you actually go do this? And I think the answer is yes, you should. Um, because in my mind, uh, there's no such thing as saying that, well, is this going to be, is it, is it, is it ready? Is it production ready? Is it not production ready? There's, there's too much gray area in between the middle. Basically, the idea in my, my perspective is, how are we as a community managing this particular feature and treating this? And that is, do we treat it, do we know that based on all of our testing that it works? Yes. Do we know that it's going to be able to durably store your data? Yes. Do we know that it handles all of these edge cases that we know that come up? Yes. It handles all of the failure. It handles the capacity adjustments. It handles all of that. And there are no known critical issues in this data path as far as, um, well, you might lose data. It's not the case. We don't know of anything like that. And that puts it in the same categories we have as replicas and saying that we will continue to develop this, we will continue to improve things, and as you are going forward, I would strongly say that, yes, you should consider using erasure codes. Um, like any, uh, any storage system, I would suggest that you try it out before you dump three petabytes of production data into it. But, um, yes, I think it's absolutely something you should uh, be looking at today. Um, and again, where are you going to use it? In those kind of price performance uh, balancing things, especially with the large files um, and, uh, and stuff like that. So that being said, I think we have a few moments left for questions. And we have a mic coming around here. Yeah, while we're waiting on the mic, we should add for the, uh, the on the community side of things, the, initially, like any large thing, that started off with a few people working on it and slowly grew. And I'd say since we moved to master months and months ago, the number of people getting involved and helping fix things and make things better has grown just unbelievably. New people from IBM and HP and just all over the place jumping in. So to that same line, is it is it treated like production code? It absolutely is. There's a large number of people in the community that know how to get in and make things better. It's fantastic. If you'd like to copy of these slides, the link is at the bottom of the screen. So this is really interesting. Um, I'm just curious if there's any difference in the data durability guarantee because erasure codes is like you're splitting it up and maybe the original data isn't there right. if only one block is written. Oh, what yes, awesome question. there's absolutely differences in the data durability guarantees. And you generally, it's, it generally, it's better with erasure codes. Um, we've actually the reason, got some tools for that. Yeah, and so um, the reason is it might not, it's like, wait a minute, but we're splitting it up and we don't know exactly what is, and if I just have this one thing. Um, but the way that it works is, uh, and I can't really go into a lot of detail on this, we just really don't have the time. But the basic way it works is it's splitting it up so that you can, if you're doing like a 10 plus 4, like we were uh, talking about earlier, you can lose any four pieces. But if you're doing replicas, you could lose any two pieces. Right, because you still have to have one copy of your data someplace. So uh, we're able to reconstruct how things work there. Yeah, and again, we've got a durability calculator. I'm not sure if anybody knows the URL off the top of your head, um, but um, but you can go in and punch in your number of disks, your erasure code policies versus replication. It'll give you an actual number of what your durability looks like. So actually, I understand that the fact that you've got extra four four parity bits, not two, right. effectively. But uh, it was more about when you do the put guaranteeing that the data is there before the, you get back your oh, right. uh, 200 so, status. Right. So uh, right now with Swift, we uh, will not return a successful uh, response to a write until in, in replication until we know that it has been durably uh, flushed down to the disk, at least in a quorum, which is at least more than half of the number of replicas. Um, with erasure codes, we're doing something very, very similar. 
in that we are making sure that it has been durably flushed all the way to the drive in the same way um, for a quorum, which means basically, I believe that's the uh, uh, data bits plus one. Yeah, we changed it three times, but yeah. yeah. I think that's it. Um, so the point is, though, you have the same basic characterizations of um, if you, it, in complete worst case scenario, um, after you get a successful um, uh, response, you in triple replication versus erasure, erasure codes, you're still able to uh, withstand, the cluster is still able to uh, withstand a hardware loss and still have your data. So Guaranteed or your good. money back. <laughs> <laughs> so have you done any, um, any characterization of reconstruction performance at all? Yes. Yeah, we don't have any slides on that. We were focused yeah. on just the, the put and get path. Um, that's a, a, a big area for us moving forward is to continue to look at that and understand what's tunable. Um, really, the framework there was, was carried over from replication, and some of the tunables may not make as much sense based on how we wrote the code. So we've still got some work to do there. Okay. And there's one in the back. There's a question in the back. Uh, just a quick question about the, the performance. I didn't see the number of threads you use, and I know that it uh, has a big impact in general in the performance. So have you tried with a uh, different number of threads to see what's the best number of threads that you should use to get the higher performance? In, in proxy and object server or in workload generation? Uh, in the workload generation. Um, in workload generation, we have we pretty much ran with everything. I think some of the early numbers you saw were run with pretty low concurrency, 100 threads were able to saturate 10 gigs. In the resource utilization test, there was a mix of 512 versus 1,024 versus 8,000. So not all of them were reflected in the slides just because, again, it would take forever to go through that much data. But, um, but yeah, we, we went all the way up to 8,000. Thank you. Um, did you guys measure first time to byte? Time to first byte performance. Yep. Um, did we have we, to track? I know we do measure we, it. So we we, we I, might have it after after okay, we just called it. I mean, I would, I would have expected erasure coding to be a little slower. Right. It, it, was that the case? Is that what you kind of said? <laughs> I would expect. Did you measure that, Doug? Yeah, it's in, it's definitely in the chart. I'd have to blow up on my phone or something. But <laughs> I'm fairly certain that time to first byte again for large objects starting at. Yes, it, it, for large is what I was. Was, yeah. was smaller. Okay, so to repeat that for the video for everybody, and so everybody in the room can hear, uh, Doug, who works at SwiftStack and did a lot of this uh, erasure code testing, thank you, uh, is uh, we did uh, the results of that were that for the larger objects, the time to first byte uh, on reads for larger objects with erasure codes was indeed smaller than for replicas, um, as kind of imp it seen as well as the the overall throughput is is better as well. Uh, for smaller bytes, uh, for smaller objects, replicas were better. So do you have some ideas on how you're going to solve your small object problem? I'm sorry? Uh, the, the small object problem. What, yeah. what kind of ideas are you guys batting? So ahead. there's a few things we can do. Um, and like, like Paul said, there's not a shortage of ideas, um, but we haven't really converged on saying that this is the way we're going to do it. Some of the things we talked about pretty early on were, okay, well, instead of trying to actually erasure code this, let's just do something simple. And if it's a 1K object, let's just store it 14 times, and that'll be fine. Um, and the benefit of uh, the, the performance on that would be better than uh, the extra cost of storing 14K versus 3K with triple replication. Other things you could do in there is uh, potentially figure out the erasure uh, the, the object size uh, and um, do something at a slightly higher level and kind of shunt that into a particular policy or not. Um, that sounds a little bit more complicated. But like one of the really hard- Like tier kind of thing? Yeah. One of the really hard problems on this is that um, most or many times when Swift receives a request, we don't actually know how big the object is going to be uh, because they can just simply start streaming data with like a chunk transfer encoding without a content length and then the data is done when they stop sending data. And so uh, there's some things, for example, we could say that if we re read the entire uh, body within that segment size, great, maybe we'll just spew that out and not erasure code it. But if it uh, spans more than one segment size, then we'll go ahead and erasure code that out, which actually makes a lot of sense as far as uh, where you start to see some of those, uh, those uh, 
crossovers in the graphs as far as what, what's actually going on. So in this case, if you're using the defaults, potentially less than one megabyte would just be replicated out, and then uh, potentially the, the over one megabyte would be uh, erasure coded, and you could change that uh, based on that particular segment size now. So that's one idea. I don't know if it's a particularly good idea, but it is an idea, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of other things that we'll, we'll figure out as a community. So again, to echo what Paul said, uh, we've had a fantastic community around this. I see many of you in here right now who have really helped out. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has done that, helped us testing, um, helped us writing this over the last few years. The Swift community is really great. If you would like a Swift shirt, you can get one in the marketplace today at the Swift Stack booth. Many people have them on. They're pretty awesome. Just come write um, some code and you get one for free. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thank you very much um, Thanks. for your time.